हेलो फ्रेंड्स वेलकम टू द यूट्यूब लाइव सेशन आई एम डॉक्टर अखिलेश द फिजियोलॉजी फैकल्टी सो इन द टूडेज लाइव वीडियो सेशन आई विल टेल यू द इम्पॉर्टेंट क्वेश्चन विच हैज बीन आस्क इन द एम सी आई एग्जाम फ्रॉम द फिजियोलॉजी सब्जेक्ट सो I am also the author of uh, one of the book for the MCA exam, that is the conceptual physiology review. If you want to study the book, you can buy it from the Amazon also. So coming to this, uh, the first the first session here. So in this uh, YouTube live uh, session, uh, I will discuss with the questions which I will ask in the exam, and uh, I will give the explanations that will be helpful to you, and. Uh, this physiology session will also help you, helpful for you to uh, in uh, solving some questions from medicines and some biochemistry also so i will uh, keep telling you the relevant uh, physiology the relevant pathology relevant pharmacology and the relevant medicine also so let us look at the first question here uh, which uh, which was asked in the mca exam so the question here is the patient is brought uh, to the emergency department with weakness confusion shortness of the breath and the lab result reveals hyperkalemia so hyperkalemia is defined as the potassium level more than right so whenever you attempt the question to so read this area very carefully so this is called the stem of the question so read it very carefully before answering to the uh, options or going to the options or before answering them read them carefully and after reading them carefully uh, think of the possible answer in your mind so think the possible answer in your mind and after thinking the possible answer then look for the options and look for the options and match your answer if your answer will match with the options then 99.99% it is a correct answer right so in this question what is what is the uh, what has been asked uh, in this question so hyperkalemia is defined as potassium level more than so we have to focus on this one right so definition of the hyperkalemia is you should you know very well that the potassium level normal potassium level is how much so normal potassium level is from 3.5 to 5.0 millimole per liter or you can also say that milli equivalent per liter right so in some in some uh, people also it may normally may be it may be 5.1 normally it may be 5.2 also and in some person it may normally be 5.3 also right so we define the hyperkalemia when uh, the potassium level is more than 5.5 right so we define the hyperkalemia when potassium level is more than 5.5 millimole per liter or milli equivalent per liter right so in this option we the answer is what answer is option c that is 5.5 millimole right so you can see the clinical picture here the weakness the confusion and the shortness of the breath so these features they can be seen in the uh, hyperkalemia also and the features can be seen in the hypokalemia also right so hyperkalemia and hypokalemia they both will present with almost almost similar feature except there is 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 change so they both will present with the weakness they both will present with the confusion right so this is for the clinical knowledge i'm telling you so they can present with the weakness they can present with confusion so in this question it was asked as a hyperkalemia and also remember what is the normal plasma sodium level or normal serum sodium level so normal sodium level is how much it is 135 to 145 millimole per liter or you can also say that milli equivalent per liter right so you know very well in monovalent ions in the 
monovalent. Monovalent means covalency is one. For the monovalent ions, right? So millimole equals to the milli equivalent. So we can replace this word with each other. So the plasma sodium level is normally is 135 to 145 millimole per liter, and we define it the hypernatremia. So hypernatremia is defined as when the sodium level is more than 135 millimole per liter. Right, it is called the hypernatremia, and we call it the hyponatremia. So hyponatremia is defined when so. Sorry, the hyper hypernatremia defined when it is more than 145. So make the correction here. And hyponatremia is defined as when the sodium level is less than 135 millimole per liter. Right. So hypernatremia is defined when it is more than 145 milli millimole per liter. And the hyponatremia is defined as less than 135 millimole per liter. Right. So similarly here, remember about this the hyperkalemia so hyperkalemia is defined as when it is uh, more than the uh, potassium level is more than 5.5 millimole per liter right so in this question the correct answer is what the correct answer is the option c 5.5 millimole per liter now let us look at the next question so in the next question the another question this was also asked in the mc exam so which of the following causes entry of potassium into the cell it has been asked that the causes entry of potassium into the cell right so potassium will move from outside to inside right so outside you call it what outside you call it the ecf and inside you call it what the icf right so potassium is moving from outside to inside right so which hormone will cause this one so the famous hormone which is frequently asked in the exam also so this this famous hormone are one is the insulin other is the aldosterone so these are the two famous hormones they will cause the entry of potassium into the cell right so insulin and aldosterone so remember here so answer here is what insulin and remember one mnemonic here so this mnemonic is insulin insulin shifts insulin shifts potassium in the cell insulin shifts potassium in the cell so in in the insulin and in the cell so potassium will the insulin will shift potassium in the cell right so in this question insulin is the option if suppose insulin is not given in the option then the other option is what other will be the aldosterone so these are the two hormones which will cause the entry of potassium into the cell and remember one thing also that this insulin right this insulin is causing what it is causing the entry of potassium into the cell so it is causing entry of potassium into the cell so what will happen because of this what happens is there is decrease in the ecf potassium level so ecf potassium level will decrease right so this may lead to so this there it may lead to there is there is chances of or it may lead to so the chances of developing the hypokalemia right so insulin may lead to the hypokalemia right so these are the this is the one of the danger thing with the insulin so remember this thing that overdose of insulin so we have to be take very precaution when we give the insulin to the patient so overdose of the insulin it may cause so it may cause so two thing it may cause it may cause one thing is what hypoglycemia so blood glucose level will fall so it may lead to the hypoglycemia and the other thing it may lead to what it may lead to the hypokalemia also so whenever we give the insulin to any patient we need to monitor the blood glucose level as well as what to monitor the other option let us look at the other options also so addison's disease this is due to this is due to the aldosterone deficiency 
right in the addition disease there is all the aldosterone deficiency right addition disease acidosis and the hyperosmolality these three they will lead to what they will shift the potassium from inside the cell to outside the cell right so they will shift the potassium from inside the cell to outside the cell just opposite so in this question it has been asked which will which of the following causes entry of potassium into the cell so answer is insulin or aldosterone and the remaining these three option they will shift the potassium from the cell to out of the cell right now let us look at another question which i which was asked in the mc exam so in this question whenever you see uh, the questions having multiple lines so do not be afraid of them read them carefully and look the clue in the question the clue will be there in the question only and think the possible answer so look at this question here so what is happening here is a 70 year old man so here old the aged the person the aged man with type 1 diabetes is brought to the emergency department with impaired mental status and general light muscle weakness right so lab test reveal what a blood glucose level of 500 this is too much 500 mg per deciliter the glucose is too much high so what do it mean the type 1 diabetes the type 1 diabetes you know very well it is it develop in the young onset young people and this blood glucose is very high 500 so this person this man is having the diabetes for a very long year and the glucose is this much so it may it is what the, the diabetes is not controlled right so which of the following increases and when we give the insulin so if we give the insulin to the untreated type 1 this is given what untreated 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 means what so untreated means this has the high blood glucose level so this has high blood glucose level so when you give insulin when you will give the insulin to this person what will happen so insulin will do one thing what it will do insulin it will lead to what it will decrease in what decrease in the plasma glucose level so this insulin will decrease the plasma glucose level and what it will decrease it will decrease what it will decrease the potassium level also so it will decrease the plasma potassium level also right so this, when you give insulin the glucose will go down the potassium level will also go down and what is the third thing here so when this glucose will go down so there will be decrease in what decrease in the ketone bodies so decrease in the ketone bodies right so what when the ketone bodies will decrease so what will happen here so this acidosis right so in the you know very well in the diabetic in the insulin deficiency they develop, develop what diabetic ketoacidosis so this diabetic ketoacidosis right so this acidosis what will happen here so there will be increase in the ph level right so earlier the diabetic ketoacidosis so ph will be less right ph will be less and so when we give the insulin then what will happen here the ph will start rising up right it will come to the start rising up and try to come to the normal level right and when the plasma glucose level will decrease so because of this one what will happen to the urine glucose so it will also decrease so decrease in the urine glucose level also right so in urine glucose will also de also decrease so now let us uh, look at the options here so option a is what option a is serum potassium level so what will happen in, the, in this question what is asked here which of the following will increase so it is asked that which of the following will increase right so the serum potassium level will it is going to decrease not increase here right so potassium level will decrease in the previous question i told you what will happen to the blood glucose level when we give the insulin when they give the insulin right so when we give the insulin what will happen to the blood glucose level it will also start decreasing right what will happen to the plasma ph so plasma ph will start increasing right because it will change from acidosis to try to come to the normal level right and what will happen to the urine glucose level so urine glucose level will also decrease right so urine glucose level will also decrease here so what is the correct answer here so correct answer here is the 
plasma pH. So plasma pH will start rising up. Right. So one of our student has marked the answer B. So answer answer B option the B is not the right answer because when you give the insulin, the blood glucose level will fall. Insulin will decrease the blood glucose level. You know very well. So it will not increase. The glucose level will fall down. Right. So in such question, the long long there try to find the clue. Right. And think what is asked in the this question. It is asking what increases. Which of the following will increases? Right. So like this, mark, uh, think of the possible answer, and then go for the option. Right. So now come to the uh, next MC question. Next question which is asking MC exam. So the next next question is what the 10% dextrose is. So in the exam you will get. Uh, uh, very simple questions also and uh, you will get uh, some complicated questions also so when the questions are easy so do not make any wrong do not make any wrong right hold your nerve and cool uh, cool down your brain and answer them uh, with your cool mind right so 10% dextrose is, so this is what the, the question is actually asking about the whether it is isotonic, whether it is hypertonic, whether it is hypertonic, right. So you, are, you know very well what is meaning of the isotonic. So isotonic fluid, what is meaning of the isotonic fluid? So isotonic fluids are what? Whose tonicity, the fluids whose, the fluids whose tonicity is equal to is equal to plasma is equal to that of the plasma so they are called as isotonic fluids right what are the examples of the isotonic fluid the examples of the isotonic fluid is 0.9 percent NaCl right then it is the 5 percent dextrose or the sucrose right 10 percent is the mannitol right so 10 percent is the mannitol and 20% urea. So these are the examples of isotonic fluid. Right. So these are examples of isotonic fluid. And when the concentration will decrease, right, if the concentration will decrease, so what do we call them? If the concentration will decrease, we call them what? We call them the hypotonic fluid. Right. And if the concentration will increase, then what we call them? So we call them the hypertonic fluid. Right. So what is the answer here? So uh, in the option, in the uh, stem, right, in the stem, what is asked here? The 10% dextrose, so dextrose is 10%. So 10% you can see here, it is what? It is the hyper, more than 5%, right? So it is the hypertonic fluid. So answer here is what? C, hypertonic fluid right so now again look at the next question which was asked in the mc exam right again here you can see here the multiple liner uh, stem is given here but not, not need to worry let us look at this the stem read the carefully and answer it properly so what I here is a 65 year old uncontrolled hypertensive male right so when the blood pressure will not be under control, then what will happen here? Obviously the stroke will develop, right? Uncontrolled hypertension, what it will lead to? It will lead to the rupture of the artery, right? And rupture of this, the artery, the lenticulostriate artery. So lenticulostriate artery, it will rupture, right? So it will, what will happen here? So rupture, what will happen here? Stroke will develop, right? And when the stroke is developed, the patient was uh, admitted to the hospital. And these are the features of uh, the area affected, aphasia and hemiparesis. Right, so hemiparesis is there. So CT scan reveals an increase in the ICT. ICT means intracranial tension. Right, so intracranial tension is increased here. So which of the following fluid will be most effective in reducing his rate intracranial tension, right? So it is asking that most effective in reducing the raised intracranial tension, right? So which fluid we give here? So we give the hypertonic mannitol, right? We will use the hypertonic mannitol. So 
hypertonic mannitol is used uh, it is used to decrease the intracranial to decrease the intracranial tension right hypertonic mannitol right so in this option the urea we do not use so mannitol is the one option here right so one option is mannitol here others no others mannitol is not given so obviously the answer will be what answer will be the b now let us see whether this is the hypertonic or not right it is what here 350 you know very well what is the plasma osmolality so plasma osmolality is this is equals to 280 to 295 milli osmoles per liter right so here it is 350 the plasma is how much 280 to 295 so 350 is more than that so this 350 mannitol is hypertonic mannitol right so it is a hypertonic mannitol and i told you this that this the hypertonic mannitol is used to decrease the intracranial tension so answer definitely is what here b right so remember this mannitol should be the tonicity of the mannitol should be more than this normal value so then it will be hypertonic so remember this hypertonic mannitol is used and this is the hyper this is the example of hypertonic mannitol so answer here is so now let us look at the another question here this is the one of the uh, uh, question which has been asked many times in the exam in the MCI exam and uh, there is uh, if you know this this is the easy one otherwise if you uh, do not uh, have this concept then it will become the very tough also which are the following is highest ph right highest ph means what what is the meaning of the highest ph highest ph means what the most acidic or alkaline so here it is what most alkaline remember this right highest ph most alkaline right and lowest pH, when the pH will be lowest, so lowest pH means what? So lowest pH is most acidic, right? So most acidic. It is asking the highest pH. You know very well, gastric juice, the pH is 0 0.8 to 3.0, right? So gastric juice, the pH is uh, 0.8 to 3.0. So what it will be? it is the lowest one right so it has the you know very well the gastric juice has the lowest ph right the gallbladder bile the ph is 7.0 to 7.4 hepatic duct bile the ph is 7.8 to 8.6 and the pancreatic juice the ph is 7.8 to 8.4 right so remember this also the fluids having highest ph right so the fluids having highest ph highest ph fluids in body so highest highest uh, ph fluid in the body one is what which one one is the this brunner's gland secretion so brunner's gland secretion it has the ph of approximately 8.3 to 9.0 this is the more alkaline than this hepatic duct by hepatic duct by right whose ph is how much 7.8 to 8.6 and this is slightly more alkaline than the pancreatic juice which ph is how much 7.8 to 8.4 right so if so if, if the question is highest pH, then look for the Brunner's gland secretion. If not in the option, then go for the hepatic duct bile. If not in the option, then go for the pancreatic juice. Right. And here we have the both option, the hepatic duct bile and the pancreatic juice. So the best answer is which one? The hepatic duct bile. Right. So this question answer is what? Hepatic duct bile. Now come to the uh, next question here. So next question is, so which of the following organelles play a pivotal role in the apoptosis? 
So in the above process, the two type the questions are asked in the exam. This is one of the very important topic from the examination point of view. So important topic from examination point of view, right? It is important in the pathology also. So from the physiology point of view, which organelle play a pivotal role in the apoptosis? So can anyone answer here? So which is the most important uh, uh, who play a pivotal role in the apoptosis? So answer here is, answer here is the mitochondria. Right, so answer here is the mitochondria, it play important role in the apoptosis, mitochondria. And also remember, uh, uh, remember this on the apoptosis, uh, what is the meaning of the apoptosis? So apoptosis, the meaning is what? So apoptosis is, it is the programmed cell death. So apoptosis is the programmed cell death. So this is the meaning of the, so two types of questions are asked here. So what is the apoptosis? This question has been asked many times in the exam, many, many times in the exam that apoptosis is, or programmed cell death is called as, right? And this question has also appeared in the exam that which organelle, cell organelle play a role in the apoptosis. So answer here is the mitochondria. Now let us come to the another question here. Another, another question which was asked in the MCA exam that which of the following is not a molecular, which of the following is not a molecular motor. So remember this, what are the examples of the molecular motor? So what are the examples of the molecular motors? So molecular motors, the examples are, there are four types, right? So one is the dynein, other is the kinesin, so kinesin, dynein, the third one is the dynamin, and the fourth one is the myosin. So these are the four molecular motors. So what is the meaning of the molecular motors? So molecular motor simple means what? So the molecular motors, they are what? So they are the force generating. Molecular motors are the force generating molecules in the cell. So they are force generating molecules in the cell. Right, so they will generate the force in the cell and because of their uh, force generating power, so they will lead to movement inside the cell. So right, for example, you know very well, what will happen here is the myosin. Myosin will help in what? It will help in the skeletal, in the uh, muscle contraction, right? For example, the myosin will help in the muscle contraction. So it will help in the muscle contraction, right? Dynamin, it is involved in the endo, cytosis so it is involved in the endocytosis the dynein so it will help in one is the beating of cilia it will help in the beating of the cilia right and other one is it will help in the transport it will help in the rapid transport of molecule in the cell so it will help in rapid transport of molecule in the cell the kinesin will also help in rapid transport of molecule in the cell so this is meaning of the molecular motor. Which one is not the molecular motor here? So myosin is the molecular motor, actin is not the molecular motor, dynein is the molecular motor, kinesin is the molecular motor. So what is asking the question here is not a molecular motor. So what is the answer here? Answer is the B, actin. Right? So in this question, the answer is the actin, actin not a molecular motor. Now, what do you see in the diagram? So in the diagram you can see here, this is the kinesin, a molecular motor, diagram of the molecular motor, the dynein, diagram of the another molecular motor, so here the word here is what? Cytoplasmic dynein, right? And there is another molecular motor which is called as the myosin. Dynamin is not shown in this picture. So dynein is there, right? Remember one thing also, the other dynein which is called as the axoplasmic dynein. So this axoplasmic dynein, it will help in the beating of cilia in the body. It will help in the beating of cilia in the body, right? And if this axoplasmic dynein is defective, then what it will lead to? So when it is defective, then it will lead to the Cartagena syndrome. 
So when it is defective, it will lead to the Cartagener syndrome. Right. So remember about this one also. So Cartagener syndrome, what is defective here? The exoplasmic dynein is defective in this Cartagena syndrome. Right. So now let us look at the next question here. So another question which was asked in the MCA exam. Consistent with the Charcot Marie Tooth disease. Right. So Charcot Marie Tooth disease. This Charcot Marie Tooth disease. Right. So what happens is here it is the defective. So here it is the defective connexin. So connexin is defective here. Right. So connexin is defective here. So what will happen here is you know very well. So connexin make the gap junction. So it will lead to what? It will be the defective gap junction. So connexin is defective. So defective gap junction is there. And when the gap junctions are defective, so what it will lead to? It will lead to the decrease in the conduction. Right, so decrease in the conduction here in the neuron. So here we are talking about the neuron, so this nerve conduction decrease here. Right, so now what is the, what, what is asked in the question? So connexin is an important component of which of the following? So connexin is an important component of the gap junction. Right, remember here the six Connexins. So six connexins, they will unite to form one connexion. They will unite to form one connexion and this connexion will form the gap junction. So I will show you the picture here also so, so that you can understand it better way. So look at this. So you can, do you see this, the connexion here? And do you see this? One, two, three, four, five, and six. So these are the six. Each individual is called as the connexin. Right? And this six connexin, they will make the one connexion. And this connexion is making what? So you can see here that they are making what is this? They are called as the gap junction. So if they are defective, the gap junction will also defective. So the defect will lead to what? Lead to the charcot, marry, tooth, disease right so now again now let us look at the next question here so uh, next slide or here so in this slide what we can see here that this is the gap junction so gap junction you can see here the molecules they are moving from one cell to other cell right and this this transfer is by directional so remember about this gap junction so this remember about this gap junction the two things remember. Number one thing is, so this transport of substance, so this transport of the substances, it bypasses the ECF. It bypasses the ECF means what? So ECF is not involved here. These molecules will move directly from one cell to other cell without going the ECF. So ECF is bypassed here, number one thing. Number two thing, so this transport is bidirectional. Bidirectional means the transport is bidirectional means what? So this can happen in both directions. Means what? It can move from one cell to other cell and it can move from other cell to the first cell. So it can be both, it is a bidirectional. So remember these two things on the gap junction also. Right. So now let us look at the another question here which was asked in the MCA exam. So the other question is the insulin mediated glucose uptake in skeletal muscle and adipose tissue occurs through. So this has been asked many times in the MCA exam that the insulin mediated glucose uptake in skeletal muscle and the adipose tissue occurs through the GLUT4. Right. So remember this thing, the two things which are very frequently asked in the MCA exam. So one thing is what? So one thing is that the uh, the beta cells of the pancreas, the beta cells of the pancreas, they have. So beta cells of pancreas, they have what type of the GLUT? So they have the GLUT2. Right. Beta cells of pancreas, they have the GLUT2. And 
the muscle right the muscle and the adipose tissue right so skeletal muscle the skeletal muscle the cardiac muscle right and the adipose tissue they have the glute bone so these two are very frequently asked in the exam and also remember one thing here the rbc it has the glute one right so rbc has the glute one so remember these are frequently asked in the mc exam so glute four present on the muscle and adipose tissue and the glute two present on the beta cells of the pancreas so rbc has the glute one right now let us look at the another question here so this this is one of the very frequently asked uh, questions in the mci so co transport of glucose with sodium is an example of co tra co transport of glucose with sodium is an example of so this i will explain here with this uh, diagram so this i am making the diagram here this is the diagram of a cell right and in this cell there is one pump so this pump will throw out the three sodium out of the cell and the two potassium inside the cell and the name of this pump is what so this pump is called as the sodium potassium atpase it is called as sodium potassium atpase it will pump three sodium out of the cell and two potassium inside the cell so the sodium potassium atpase is an example of primary active transport example of primary active transport so it is called as primary active because it will consume the because it will consume the atp directly so it is called as primary active transport right primary active transport and you can see here this substances are moving in the opposite direction so the substance is moving in the opposite direction so it is also an example of the antipode so it is also an example of antipode right so when the sodium will go out what will happen to the sodium level inside the cell the sodium level inside the cell will decrease so what will happen here is now the sodium will enter from outside of the cell to inside and along with the glucose so sodium will enter inside the cell along with the glucose or along with the galactose so glucose or the galactose sodium will enter this uh, sodium will enter right so this is called as secondary active transport this is called as secondary active transport so this type of transport is called as secondary active transport because why it is called as secondary active because this transport is because of what this transport is because of the primary active transport it is because of the primary active transport right so it is because of primary active transport so it is called as the secondary active transport so it is because of the sodium potassium atpase and what is name of this pump here the name of this pump is sglt right sglt if it is in the intestine it will be the sglt1 right sglt1 and if it is in the in the kidney it will it may be sglt1 or sglt2 right so it is a secondary active transport and this the two the two uh, sodium and the glucose they are transported in the same direction right so this is also called as the symport this is also called as the symport right so this sodium it will go out of the cell and this glucose it will or, or the galactose they will go out of the cell so this glucose or this galactose they will go out of the cell with the help of what with the help of the glute right glute means glucose transporter so this glute is an example of it is an example of facilitated diffusion it is an example of facilitated diffusion right it is an example of facilitated diffusion you know very well and the it is transporting one substance so it is also called as the uniport the glute is also called as uniport right so <clears throat> it is also called as the uni 
court. So now let us come back to the question here. What we ask here, it is called as a court transport. Court transport means it is also called as the sim port. So sim port of glucose with sodium. So glucose with sodium. So what diagram I, what I have told you? So glucose is moving along with the sodium. So sodium is going inside and the glucose is going also going inside. So it is what? It is example of the secondary active transport. Right, secondary active transport. This has been asked many times in the MC exam. So it is secondary active transport. Right. Now look at the another question here. The function of SGLT. So again, many times in the exam, SGLT. So this can be explained in the previous slide also. The function of SGLT1. So what this SGLT1 is doing? So it is transporting the sodium and glucose and the galactose inside the cell. Example of what? Secondary active transport. Example of what? Simport. Now let us look at the option here. So SGLT1 is glucose absorption by secondary active transport. So this option is correct here. Right. So glucose absorption is primary active. It is not the primary active. Glucose absorption facilitated diffusion. It is not a facilitated diffusion. Simple diffusion. It is not a simple diffusion. So SGLT is what? Secondary active transport. Right. So remember here S for SGLT. SGLT full form is sodium dependent glucose transporter and S for secondary active transport, right? So S for secondary active transport. So SGLT, secondary active transport. So now, this times in the exam, this question and the previous question also, many times in the exam, even in the last MC exam, this question, this, this question appeared. Now let us look at the question here. So transport of two substances in the same direction is called as. So I told you, if the transport is going in the opposite direction, what it is called? Transport is going in the same direction, what it is called? And I told you, if the transport here is involving the one substance, what it is called? If it is involving one substance, we call it what? The uniport. If it will involve the two substances in the same direction, it will be called as the symport. Right, symport. As for symport, as for same, same direction. And opposite, so obviously what meaning of what anti, anti means opposite. So anti opposite transport. So transport of two substances in the same direction is called as the symport. Remember here, <coughs> as for same and as for the symport. So answer here is A symport. Right. So what do we see in this uh, slide here? So one substance is going through this transport method, so it is called a uniport. And the two substances are transported in the same direction, so call it what symport. And one is going in in this direction, other is coming in opposite direction. So it will call it what? It will call it the antiport. So uniport, symport, and the antiport. Right. So this diagram is showing the uniport, symport, and the antiport. Now look at another uh, question. So this question, so I have told you the important question from the general physio. Now in this section, I, this section is, will cover the important questions on the topic of the blood. So, <clears throat> look at a question here, Wilson disease. When you remember this Wilson disease, so this Wilson disease is important from the pathology point of view, the physiology point of view also, and the octa point of view also. So, Wilson disease is due to deficiency of Right. So remember about the Wilson disease. So this Wilson disease is due to deficiency of the which one? Cerebroplasmin. So this cerebroplasmin is what? C for cerebroplasmin and C for copper. Right. So C for copper. So cerebroplasmin is copper binding protein. Cerebroplasmin is copper binding protein. C for cerebroplasmin, C for the copper. It is copper binding protein. 
right so its deficiency its deficiency will lead to what so its deficiency will lead to the wilson disease right so its deficiency will lead to the wilson's disease and what will happen the wilson disease here so this will lead to the hepato lenticular hepato lenticular means degeneration of the liver hepato right hepato lenticular so lenticular nucleus in the brain so hepato lenticular degeneration so they will degenerate here because the copper will deposit here right number two thing will be so it will lead to the deposition of it will lead to the deposition of copper where in the copper so deposition of copper in the cornea where in the cornea so deposition of copper in the decimates membrane so deposition of copper in decimates membrane in the cornea right so decimates membrane in the cornea and this will lead to formation of the kesher plesher ring kf ring right so remember the things here we should remember wilson disease whenever the talk will wilson disease remember about the cerebroplasmin what is cerebroplasmin c for cerebroplasmin c for copper so copper binding protein remember in the wilson disease there is hepato lenticular d generation and remember about the wilson disease there is what the kf ring formation because of what deposition of copper in the decimates membrane of the cornea right and look at the picture of the kf ring you can see here this the ring structure which is marked by the arrow so you can see here the structure ring structure here which is marked by this arrow so this is called as what which ring here so this ring is called as the kesher glacier ring kf ring right so this kf ring in the wilson disease this has been asked many times in the exam not only the mci it has been asked in the pg level exam also so let us look another question on this the wilson disease so this was asked in the mci exam so what is the question here is the eye examination of a patient of the wilson disease is shown in the picture right so eye examination is there so what do you see in the eye examination what this ring is there so kf ring is there right the structure pointed in the arrow is due to deficiency of so obviously i told you this explained here so answer is what here answer is cerebroplasmin right it would answer cerebroplasmin right so wilson disease kf ring cerebroplasmin hepato lenticular degeneration remember them now come to the another question the site of action of erythropoietin right so remember about the erythropoietin the in the short form erythropoietin is also called as epo right so in the erythropoietin you have to remember the three things number one thing is what is the sites of sites of production of the erythropoietin sites of production of erythropoietin or the main source of the erythropoietin the main source one is the kidney right so 85% of this erythropoietin is produced by the kidney and only the 15% of this erythropoietin is produced by the liver so remember one thing about the kidney remember other thing about the liver right so out of these two which is the main source for the erythropoietin kidney is the main source in the kidney where it is produced it is produced by the it is produced by so interstitial cells of peritubular capillaries it is produced by interstitial cells produced by the interstitial cells of the peritubular so capillary interstitial cells of peritubular capillaries right so sites of production of erythropoietin the main site is the kidney other is the liver the other thing you have to remember is which will increase in the erythropoietin right so remember 
in the hypoxia is the main stimulus hypoxia it is the main stimulus for increase in the atropoietin level right so hypoxia is the main stimulus for increase in the atropoietin level and also remember who will decrease the atropoietin and here one hormone name you remember that hormone is the estrogen right so estrogen will decrease the atropoietin level right so therefore female have less rbc therefore female have less rbc as compared to the male and the third thing which we have to remember here is that the third thing which remember is what what this atropoietin will do so this atropoietin it will go and acts on where it will act on so it will act on the bone marrow right where in the bone marrow it will act <clears throat> in the bone marrow it is going to stimulate the stem cells right stimulate the stem cells also called as the stem cells are also called as hemocytoblasts right so also called the hemocytoblast or the stem stem cells hemocytoblast right they will stim stimulate them and it will lead to what it will lead to the atherosclerosis so it will lead to production of the rbc or the erythropoiesis right so remember this important things on the atherosclerosis which has been asked in the exam very in the mci exam many times it has been asked so one thing you have to remember sites of the atherosclerosis production or what is source of the atherosclerosis who will increase the atherosclerosis main source is the hypoxia who will decrease the atherosclerosis remember one hormone here estrogen and where this atherosclerosis will act it will act on the bone marrow where in the bone marrow it will act in the bone marrow it will act on the stem cell or the hemocyto blast what it will lead to there it will lead to the atherosclerosis or rbc production right so in this question it is a very simple question that you ask the site of action of atherosclerosis is very simple here answer here is what bone marrow now let us look at another question here this the inheritance pattern of sickle cell anemia is so inheritance pattern of sickle cell anemia is it is the autosomal recessive pattern it will ask in them say exam and there may chances also appearing in the exam also so <coughs> this is the direct question here inheritance pattern of sickle cell anemia it is the autosomal recessive so from the examination point of view so you have to remember what are the various autosomal right what are the various autosomal dominant disorders and what are the various autosomal recessive disorders so you learn them so you might have the table of this one but various autosomal dominant and various autosomal recessive disorders so almost almost one questions appear in the exam from this table autosomal dominant and autosomal recessive here so in this question sickle cell anemia is the autosomal recessive right and the example of autosomal dominant autosomal dominant example is so example is the von willebrand right von willebrand so one variety of the von willebrand so von willebrand deficiency disease right so von willebrand so von willebrand deficiency disease so this is an example of the uh, autosomal dominant disease this is example so this von willebrand disease it is asked in the exam right so it is the autosomal dominant sickle cell anemia is example of the autosomal recessive x linked recessive the hemophilia is the example of this x linked recessive hemophilia whether it is hemophilia a or whether it is hemophilia b the both are x linked recessive right so now come to the another question here so this question has been asked uh, almost almost one question will be definitely there from this the wintrop's classification of the anemia 
so remember always go to the exam always revise this before going to the exam the winter of classification of anemia the winter of classification of anemia always revise them right so what in this what is there in this question here a 32 year old female presents with what pallor and fatigue pallor fatigue means what feature of the anemia the pallor fatigue features of the anemia so <clears throat> her lab test reveals what mcv 120 pentoliter fl means what pentoliter right what is the normal value of the mcv so normal value of this mcv is it is from <clears throat> 90 plus minus 8 pentoliter so the range is what 80 to 98 pentoliter right if this mcv if the MCV value is less than 80 pentoliter, then this is called a what? It is called as the microcytic. It is called as microcytic. So RBC is called as a microcytic, right? And if this MCV, if the MCV is more than 100 pentoliter, so then these RBC are called a what? Macro so they are called as a macro sighting right so in this uh, in this what is given here mcv is what 120 pentoliter so 120 pentoliter means what so 120 is what so 120 is the macro sighting right macro sighting so it is the macro sighting and other what is here mchc is 32 percent so what is the normal mchc so with I will uh, normal MCHC. So this the normal MCHC is this is equals to 32 plus minus 3 percent. So this this value is what normal, right? So this is called a what normochromic. If the MCHC is normal, it is called a normochromic, right? Normochromic. And <coughs> normal MCHC normochromic. And if the MCHC is less than the normal value it is called a what hypochromic it is called as the hypochromic right so hypochromic so what is given here is it is given here is the condition given here is what the condition given here is the macrocytic one thing right and other given is what normochromic which one is the macrocytic and normochromic now let us look at the option here so <clears throat> The macrocytic vitamin B12 deficiency, the folic acid deficiency, they are example of what? They are example of the macrocytic and normochromic. So they are example of macrocytic and normochromic. Right? Sideroblastic anemia, beta thalassemia, and iron deficiency anemia. The three are example of the microcytic. They are example of the microcytic and hypochromic so microcytic and hypochromic so what is the answer here is answer here is d that is vitamin b12 and the folic acid deficiency right so b vitamin b12 and folic acid deficiency now let us look at this table here so this table is showing what this table is showing the with this table is the table showing the Wintrobe's classification of anemia. So it is showing the Wintrobe's classification of the anemia, right? And in this, the Wintrobe's classification, the normochromic, hypochromic. Remember this very frequently asked in the exam. So microcytic, hypochromic. Remember this, the mnemonic here, the list. The list for L for lead poisoning, I for iron deficiency anemia, S for sideroblastic anemia, and T for the thalassemia. Right? <clears throat> so now let us look at another question here, which I will ask in the exam. A 60 year old male with history of venous thromboembolism is placed on the warfarin. So, what this warfarin will do? So you know very well this warfarin. So warfarin is vitamin K antagonist.
the is the level of factor 2 factor 9 and factor 2 in the circulation right so the worker in therapy would decrease the plasma concentration of which are the following here so it will decrease the plasma concentration of the factor so which one is matching our option here so factor 2 right it will decrease the level of factor 2 factor 7 factor 9 and factor number 10 right so it will decrease the level of uh, factor 2 7 9 and 10 so what is the answer here answer here is the prothrombin or the factor 2 right uh, let us look at the other question here so another question which has been asked in the mca exam the vitamin k a here in the clotting factors right so remember here vitamin k acts as so vitamin k acts as the cofactor right it acts as cofactor remember this word cofactor so cofactor for enzyme so cofactor for which enzyme so it will act as cofactor for enzyme carboxylase so it will act as cofactor for the enzyme carboxylase right and what this carboxylase will do so carboxylase that converts so this carboxylase will convert the glutamic acid so it will convert the glutamic acid to gamma carboxyglutamate so convert the glutamic acid to gamma carboxyglutamate right so this vitamin k acts as cofactor k cofactor for ka carboxylase convert the glutamic acid to gamma carboxyglutamate so what is the answer here is so answer here is what so it will act as the cofactor for carboxylase so answer is what carboxylation right so answer is the carboxylation answer is the b here carboxylation so so another question is similar very similar to this previous one so vitamin k causes what it will lead to the carboxylation of the glutamate right so carboxylation of glutamate that converts the glutamate to gamma carboxy glutamate right so this is the role of the vitamin k in the clotting factors so look at another question here so this was also asked in the mc exam so two regarding hemophilia a so hemophilia a so hemophilia you know very well the two types are there one is called as hemophilia a this is due to deficiency of factor number eight and other one is hemophilia b this is due to deficiency of factor number nine right so here it is asking about the hemophilia a and this hemophilia a is due to deficiency of factor number eight right so factor number deficiency of eight factor number eight so what is happening in the hemophilia a so this hemophilia a it is characterized by it is characterized by the frequent bleeding in the joints so this is a characteristic feature of the hemophilia frequent bleeding in the joints this is a characteristic feature of hemophilia a right and another thing is that so frequent bleeding in the joints and another feature of this hemophilia a hemophilia a is here it is what they increase in the activated partial thromboplastin time and the normal normal prothrombin time right and there is also increase in the clotting time and there is also normal bleeding time so bleeding time is normal clotting time will be increased prothrombin time is normal and the activated partial thromboplastin time will be increased right and there will be frequent bleeding in the joints now let us look at the option here so true regarding it is asked what true 
सो फ्रीक्वेंट हिम आर प्रोसेस और ब्लीडिंग इन द ज्वाइंट दिस इज करेक्ट दिस इज ट्रू राइट सो फैक्टर नाइन डेफिशियंसी दिस वन इज फॉल्स इंक्रीज प्रोथ्रोमिन टाइम सो प्रोथ्रोमिन टाइम इज नॉर्मल सो दिस इज आल्सो फॉल्स डिक्रीज क्लॉटिंग टाइम क्लॉटिंग टाइम विल इंक्रीज सो दिस इज आल्सो फॉल्स व्हिच इज द ट्रू वन हियर सो ट्रू वन इज द ए राइट सो इक्वेंट हिम आर प्रोसेस now let us look at another question from the mci uh, exam so macrophages are derived from remember m for macrophages and m from the monocytes very simple question asked in the mci exam so macrophages are derived from the which wbc monocyte so answer here is what where is the answer here monocyte answer is the d so monocytes right so macrophage is derived from the monocyte very simple question asked in the mci exam look at the another another question here the phagocytosis in the central nervous system is done by the phagocytosis in the nervous central nervous system so this phagocytosis is done by whom the macrophages right they are done by the macrophages so which one is the macrophage in the central nervous system so macrophage in central nervous system is the microglia so microglia remember about this microglia so microglia are so m for microglia and m for the macrophages so microglia they are the macrophages in the central nervous system right so they will do the phagocytosis so they are the macro they are the uh, macrophages in the central nervous system remember about the astrocytes so these astrocytes they help in the formation of blood brain barrier and they will uptake they will uptake potassium from brain ecf right so they will uptake potassium from the brain ecf and they will also do one thing they will convert they will convert the glutamate into glutamine so they will convert the glutamate into the glutamine so remember this one thing blood brain barrier other two thing is uptake of potassium from brain ecf and the third thing is convert glutamate into from the myelin sheath in the central nervous system right and schwann cells they will form myelin in the peripheral nervous system so they will form the myelin sheath in the peripheral nervous system right so oligodendrocyte form myelin in central nervous system and schwann cells they will form the myelin in the peripheral nervous system so what what do you see here in the diagram here so there are the types of the neuroglia some neuroglia are present in the central nervous system and some are in the peripheral nervous system right so you can see here the pendymal cell oligodendrocytes astrocytes and the microglia cells so these pendymal cells what they do is that they will help in the formation of so they will help in the formation of epithelial lining so they will help in formation of epithelial lining in the or epithelial lining in ventricles in the central nervous system or the brain so ventricles in the brain right so epithelial lining in the ventricles in the brain is formed by the ependymal cell so remember about this ependymal cell this was asked in the mc exam so the next question this one only the neuroglial cell that lines the ventricles of the brain and the central column of the spinal cord is so which will form the epithelial lining of the ventricles of brain and the central column of spinal cord so answer here is what ependymal cell so this was also asked in the mc exam so remember about this ependymal cell so let us look at the next question here which was this question also very frequently asked in the mc exam the equilibrium potential for an ion is calculated by using so remember the two things here so one thing is the equilibrium potential so remember this equilibrium potential 
So this equilibrium potential is calculated by this equilibrium potential is also called as the Nernst potential. So it is also called as the Nernst potential. So equilibrium potential is also called as Nernst potential. So equilibrium potential is calculated by right. So it is calculated by so calculated by the Nernst equation. Right. So it is called as the equilibrium potential is also called Nernst equation. So it is calculated by the Nernst equation. Right. So calculated by the Nernst equation. And the other thing which you have to remember is the resting membrane potential is calculated by. So how is the resting membrane potential calculated by? So it is calculated by the Goldman Hodgkin CAD equation. So calculated by the Goldman Hodgkin CAD equation. Goldman Hodgkin CAD equation. Right. So this RMP is calculated by the Goldman Hodgkin CAD equation. So two things we remember here equilibrium potential and the arresting membrane potential. So what is the answer here? The equilibrium potential, the answer here is the Nernst equation. Right, so Goldman Hodgkin Hodgkin Cash equation for the RMP. Now another question which has been asked in the MC exam, this also has been asked in the MC exam in the many times. The RMP of the neuron is close to the equilibrium potential of. Right, so remember this. So the answer here is the potassium ion. Right. And also remember RMP of this neuron is minus 70 millivolt and this equilibrium potential of the potassium is minus 90 millivolt. Right. So minus 90 millivolt. So this RMP of the neuron is close to the equilibrium potential of the potassium ion. So remember these two things here. Right. So very frequently asked here, so do not commit the mistake in the exam. The RMP of the neuron is close to the equilibrium potential of. So remember this, the answer here is the potassium ion. And this question was also asked in the MC exam. The resting membrane potential of the RBC is. So resting membrane potential of this RBC membrane is RMP of the RBC membrane. It is equals to minus 8.2 millivolt. It is equal to minus 8.2 millivolt. And the exam, the options were given 5, 6, 7, 8. So if you have knowledge of exact value, then only you can answer this. Otherwise, all the values are very close here. So answer here is what? So answer here is 8.2. So it is the 8 point, is the 8 minus 8 millivolt is the correct answer here. So it is minus 8 millivolt. Right. So RMP of the RBC is minus 8 millivolt. Also remember what is the RMP of the neuron? So RMP of the neuron is how much? It is minus 70 millivolt. Right. Now let us look at the another question here. So this question also uh, asked uh, in the MCI exam. And one question was also uh, asked from this topic in the last exam also. So what is the question here? A 40 year old man presents with ptosis and diplopia. The ptosis and uh, the diplopia. Typical features of the myasthenia gravis. Right. He also uh, complained of muscle weakness, fatigue and difficulty in the swallowing. Right. Again the features of the myasthenia gravis. His symptoms worsen with activity and relieved with the rest. This is the characteristic finding in the myasthenia gravis. Right. Characteristic finding in the myasthenia gravis is it is relieved with the rest and activity worsen with the with the activity. So the typical feature of the myasthenia gravis. An MRI shows enlargement of the thymus gland again favoring the myasthenia gravis. So his symptoms are due to 
So in the myasthenia gravis, what is the problem in the myasthenia gravis? In the myasthenia gravis, right, you know very well it is the autoimmune. Right, so this, this, this disorder is autoimmune. What will happen here is, here the antibodies, right, antibodies, they develop, right, so develop against whom? So antibodies, they will develop against whom? Against the nicotinic NM, acetylcholine receptors, right, NM, cholinergic receptors. So if we look at the options here, antibodies against nicotinic cholinergic NM acetylcholine receptors, right? So <coughs> option <coughs> A is the correct one. Option B, NN, no. Right, against muscarinic, no. Against voltage-gated calcium channels in the nerve ending. So this is, this happens in the Lambert-Eaton syndrome. This happens in the Lambert Eaton syndrome. Right. And in this question, the teachers are given of the myasthenia gravis. So, what is the answer here? Answer here is the antibodies against nicotinic cholinergic and M receptors. Right. So, remember about this the myasthenia gravis. Right. So, antibodies are formed against antibody are formed against the nicotinic NM cholinergic receptors number one thing number two thing is so <clears throat> there is rapid and sudden onset rapid and sudden onset of muscle fatigue right so rapid and sudden onset of the muscle fatigue the third thing remember here is the third thing remember here is that the this condition improves with the rest so this condition this will improve with the rest the condition will improve with the rest right and the fourth thing remember is what is the ugly presentation here so this ugly presentation is with the Tosis and the diplopia. Right, tosis and the diplopia. So diplopia. Right. So tosis is due to what? Involvement of upper eyelid muscles. This is the involvement of the upper eyelid muscles. Right. And this diplopia is due to what? So diplopia is due to the involvement of so this diplopia is due to involvement of what? So this is due to involvement of the extraocular muscles of eye. Right. So involvement of extraocular muscles of the eye. Right. And the fourth thing you have to remember is, the fourth thing you have to remember is the adrophonium chloride test. So adrophonium chloride test is done in the myasthenia gravis. Right. So, adrophonium chloride test is done in the myasthenia gravis. So, if you give the adrophonium chloride, what will happen here? So, the condition will improve. Right. So, improvement in the condition. Improvement in the condition in the myasthenia gravis. Improvement in the condition then is the myasthenia gravis. Right. And if the condition do not improve, right, if condition do not improve, then think of other myopathy. If condition do not improve, if condition do not improve, then what? Then think of other myopathy. Then think of the origin of the myopathy. Right. So this is the adrophonium chloride test. So in the myasthenia gravis, what will happen in the adrophonium chloride test? It will be the improvement of the condition here. So remember, antibodies are formed against the receptor here. Remember the receptor here. Remember rapid sudden onset of muscle fatigue. Remember condition includes the rest. 
and early presentation is the tosis and diplopia and remember about this adrophonium you write test for this myasthenia gravis right so <clears throat> now let us look at another question here which has been asked in the mc exam so drug used to treat the malignant <coughs> malignant hyperthermia right defective rhinodine receptor so defective rhinodine receptors right in the sarcoplasmic reticulum so myasthenia gravis is due to what defective rhinodine receptors in sarcoplasmic reticulum remember this one thing here right and number 2 here remember what is the treatment we give for this malignant hyperthermia so treatment in the emergency condition we have to use what we have to use the iv dantrolene sodium so dantrolene sodium this is used for treatment of the malignant hyperthermia dantrolene sodium so which is the correct answer here the correct answer here is the option a dantrolene sodium so i will show you this the uh, picture of so injection this is the showing the injection here the vial of the dantrolene sodium right and written clearly here for treatment of what malignant hyperthermia along with appropriate supportive measures so this dantrolene sodium is used in treatment of malignant hyperthermia right so now come to the uh, next question here uh, this question also appeared in the mci exam so which of the test modality stimulates m glur 4 what is the meaning of m glur m for metabotropic m for metabotropic glu glu for what so glu for the glutamate r for the receptor right so metabotropic glutamate receptor m glur right so this metabotropic glutamate receptor short form is m glur right so they are of type 1 to 8 they are of type 1 to 8 out of this the m glur 4 it will be stimulated by the umami taste sensation right so m glur 4 it is stimulated by the umami taste sensation right so taste sensation umami taste sensation so remember remember this thing you might be knowing about the sweet taste sensation you might be knowing about the salt taste sensation you might also be knowing about the salt taste sensation and you might be knowing about the bitter taste sensation also now the fifth basic taste sensation which i have discovered is the umami taste sensation right so that's why this question is asked in the exam so m glur 4 so which taste sensation here the umami taste sensation now come to the next question here so this question is from the cardiovascular system right so this question is from cardiovascular system so in this uh, question the if the radius of the blood vessel is doubled then what will happen to the resistance so suppose this is the one blood vessel and this is the another blood vessel and its radius is doubled right so this radius uh, the radius is the radius here is the r and its radius will be how much so its radius will be the 2r right what will happen to the resistance so you you can think you can you can apply your common sense also that the larger diameter or larger radius here the resistance is low right so the here resistance will be more and here resistance will be less so obviously this r2 will be less than the r1 right suppose this is the r1 and suppose this is the r2 so resistance in the vessel 2 will be less than the resistance in the vessel 1 and also remember this formula also the resistance to the blood flow the resistance to the blood flow resistance to the flow is equals to r right so r is equals to 
थेटा एल अपॉन पाई आर पावर फोर तो हियर द एटा इज वॉट सो हियर द एटा इज इट इज द विस्कॉसिटी ऑफ द ब्लड राइट इट इज विस्कॉसिटी ऑफ द ब्लड एंड द एल इज वॉट एल इज द लेंथ ऑफ द ब्लड वेसल एंड आर इज वॉट सो आर इज द रेडियस ऑफ द ब्लड वेसल आर इज रेडियस ऑफ द ब्लड वेसल राइट सो इन दिस इक्वेशन यू कैन सी हियर दैट इफ द रेडियस विल इंक्रीज राइट वट विल एपन टू द रेजिस्टेंस तो रेजिस्टेंस विल डिक्रीज बाय हाउ मेनी टाइम्स सो यू कैन सी हियर आर पावर फोर सो इफ द रेडियस इज डबल्ड सो वट इज द वट इज द सो इट विल बी वट विल एपन टू द रेडियस इज डबल्ड so what is the 2 power 4 so 2 power 4 is 16 so the resistance will decrease if the radius will increase resistance will decrease so resistance will decreases by how much time so two options are there so 2 power 4 is how much 16 so decreases by the 16 times right so the radius is double here resistance will decrease by 16 times here so remember this so <clears throat> this resistance is directly proportional to the viscosity directly proportional to the length and inversely proportional to r power 4 right so <clears throat> length will increase resistance will increase viscosity will increase resistance will increase if the radius will increase resistance will decrease by r power 4 right now come to the next question here the <coughs> total volume of the csf total volume of csf cerebrospinal fluid is the total volume so in the csf remember the following two things one is remember how much is the daily production of this csf so how much daily production of csf so daily production is so 550 ml right 550 ml per day is daily production and what is the total volume what is the volume of the csf so this volume is how much 150 ml so what will happen to the remaining production is more than the volume so what will happen to the remaining so this remaining csf is absorbed remaining csf is absorbed production is 550 volume is 150 so what happen to the remaining remaining cs will be absorbed by whom by the arachnoid villi so it will absorbed by the arachnoid villi right so what is the answer here answer here is the c 150 ml now <clears throat> let us look at another question here which was asked in the mcq exam well, this question has been asked many times in the mcq exam that the nitric oxide is synthesized from which amino acid right so remember about this nitric oxide nitric oxide is what it is a vasodilator it is a vasodilator remember one thing number two thing it is produced by the endothelium produced by the endothelium of the blood vessels so therefore it is also called as so therefore it is also called as so it is also called as endothelial derived relaxation factor so it is also called as endothelial derived relaxation factor endothelial derived relaxation factor in the short form it is also called as e d r f e d r f right so where this nitric oxide what is the source of the nitric oxide in the endothelium the source of this nitric oxide is the source of nitric oxide it is produced from the amino acid arginine produced by the amino acid arginine right in the endothelium there is an enzyme called as nitric oxide synthase nitric oxide synthase which will lead to production of the nitric oxide plus l citrulline right 
nitric oxide plus L citrulline. So this <coughs> nitric oxide is the size of which amino acids? So answer here is what? Answer is the arginine. So option D is the arginine. So correct answer is the arginine. Right. So also remember one thing uh, in the exam here. The mechanism of action of nitric oxide is through. Now what this nitric oxide will do? This nitric oxide will stimulate one enzyme. So what is the name of this enzyme here? Its name is guanylcyclase. So, guanyl so it will stimulate the enzyme guanylcyclase. Now what this guanylcyclase will do? It will convert. So it will convert the GTP into cyclic GMP. And what the cyclic GMP will lead to? This cyclic GMP will lead to the vaso dilation will lead to the vaso dilation right so nitric oxide that will stimulate the guanylase cyclase this guanylase cyclase will lead to for conversion of gtp into cyclic gmp right and this will lead to the vaso dilation one more one hormone here which act in the same way that is the atrial natriuretic peptides remember about the anp also this ANP will also stimulate this guanyl cyclase and this will lead to formation of cyclic GMP and this will lead to what? Vasodilation. So answer here is what? Answer here is the cyclic GMP option A. Right. So this is the all about the today's session. So thank you very much about the today's session and uh, we will cover the remaining portions in the next YouTube live session which will be the link of which will be shared soon to you. So thank you very much.